You're watching Drake Wing Gaming. Enjoy the video. Hey guys and gals, Nary here from Drake Wing Gaming. Some of you may on Twitter the gaming drag today. I'm coming back at you another Let's Play episode of In Case of Emergency, Cedric's Path. So yeah, let's go ahead and jump right back into it, shall we? Alarm chain, you are up and let's go. We'll help Cedric. You jump to Cedric's aid, steel sword flashing along his, alongside his. Together, you manage to beat back the tide of sweet-smelling bread monsters with your blades. Cedric skewers a final creature before wiping crumbs off along the side of his pants. Luke has a stripe of charcoal smudged across his nose, but otherwise looks like he's made it out unscathed. You're about to congratulate each other when a rumble from the hallway reminds you this isn't over. Barreling down the corridors of Peregrine, so large it leaves behind a trail of flour where it scrapes the ceiling, is a massive loaf of the ultimate bread, ciabatta. While you're still, star still staring with your mouth agape, Wes slams the door shut just in time. He braces himself against the heavy wooden door as the ciabatta loaf slams its tough yet springy crust against it, sending dust and debris raining from the ceiling. The weapon on the wall, the weapon on the wall rattle in their weapons on the wall rattle in their mounts. <clears throat> Luke, what did you do? Why does everybody always assume it's my fault? Is it not your fault? Yeah, it's not the point. Why does anyone else get grief for the things they do? Wes is always taking his shirt off his shirt for no reason, but no one brings that up. It gets hot. Besides, why would anyone complain about that? It's not bad. It's just unnecessary. Oh, come on. Remember when Cedric was trying to teach us medieval table etiquette for a whole week? I just thought it would be respectful to try and learn another land's customs. I just use the tiniest utensils for everything. It's so much simpler that way. A hinge on the door squeaks under the ramming of the monster bread loaf outside. Uh, guys, I think we have more pressing matters. Everyone turns to you like they expect you to have a plan. Luckily, you do. Wes, you take the front. Cedric and I will be on wait on the other side, other side of the door to ambush it. Luke, take cover in the back. Got it. Aye, aye, Captain. You grab a spiked Morningstar off the wall and toss it to Cedric. Cedric catches it easily with both hands. Open its, Break open its shell and I'll, and I'll slice it from the inside. Cedric nods. <laughs> a brass hinge holding the door in place snaps from the wall as you take your places. Shane, there isn't a giant bread knife down here, huh? Cedric's quip is cut off by the sound of the armory door being torn from its frame. Rest roars as he meets the intruder. Jabata crashes into his shield, and West plants his boots in the stone and digs in. From the back, Luke fires off hot streaks of flame that burst along the Chibata's flowered exterior, leaving black char marks where they land. The bread is so large that it pushes forward regardless, flinging West backwards. He lands on his feet, dazed as the loaf turns its eyeless gaze towards Luke in the back. Uh, guys? Oh, that's good coffee. All right. Luke throws out a flurry of attacks, each bit of flame hitting the center of the bread until there's a crisp, smoldering circle in its middle. You have only a moment to meet Cedric's eye before the two of you race forward. Cedric runs ahead of the loaf to beat it to Luke, who, sta who he stands in front of, winding up the morning star like a baseball bat aimed at the center of the burnt circle. The swing connects. If bread could scream, you think it would as the studded end of the blunt weapon breaks through the fragile blackened center of the bread and hits its gooey insides. You can practically hear the metal and stick itself from the gluten as Cedric follows through, spinning the bread just enough that you can spy its exposed inside as you run forward. Leaping towards it, you thrust your sword up and out, feeling your blade pierce through the crisp bottom layer of the bread. You yank your blade downwards, and the movement tears away bits of charred crust as it slices easily through the soft center. Time slows for a moment. And everyone joins in, battering the ciabatta with their respective abilities. The entire room is starting to smell like a burning bakery. As the four of you stand over your kill like big game hunters, bits of dough splattered across the walls of the armory, you realize there's someone you haven't checked on. Wait, wait, wait! Where's Remus? Everyone stops wailing on the fallen ciabatta for a beat. They all look at each other. Uh... Shit! I have to check on him! You're already bouncing on the balls of your feet as you say this. Without waiting for an answer, you burst through the door and take off through the castle. You've spent so much time here that you know every turn and curve of the path of the, to the gardens better than the back of your hand. Your legs and chest burn as you race through familiar halls and chambers. You're expecting the worst. Remus backed into a corner by a company of croissants, a battalion of brioche, or a platoon of pita. 
You picture fighting off his assailants and rescuing him, retiring to the country and making a life for yourself there. The final surge of energy, you burst into a familiar landscape. Remus is sitting at the gazebo where you first spoke, sipping from a delicate cup of porcelain. You're... you're okay! Kieran, I was expecting you. Please, have a seat. The tea is still hot. You warily scan the garden before reluctantly resheathing your sword and waddling up the gazebo. Even the grass is undisturbed down here. Remus smiles as you approach, and he pours tea into a second cup on a saucer. The cups and kettle are a matching set, trimmed with gold and decorated with strands of wisteria. Can I offer you some biscuits? They go rather well with the tea. You cringe at the thought of consuming anything flower-based after everything you've been through. No, thank you. You settle into the seat across from Remus, resting your paws on the table. The cup in front of you is filled with a dark, honey-colored liquid. Drink. You reach for the handle of the cup. Before you drink, Karen, I feel obligated to warn you. If you do, you may not be able to go back. You stop. Your lips frozen on the rim of the cup. The tea's warm, herbal-scented steam fills your nostrils. You laugh nervously as you pull the teacup away from your mouth. <laughs> Never go back. What am I, Persephone in the underworld? I drink half the cup. And I drink half the cup and I stay here for half the year? Remus chuckles good-naturedly, but you don't think he's trying to pull your leg here. Perhaps. Think carefully on this. Persephone's mother mourned so deeply that she created the seasons of winter and autumn. So great was Demeter's love that she altered the very nature of the world for her child. Now it's your turn to laugh. I don't think my mom would miss me very much. If I was the one in the myth, we'd probably have a week of fall or just a day of winter. Imagine, Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas, one right after the other. Bam, bam, bam! Non-stop holidays! Be a wreck. How little love cares for the plans of man. Not even the gods could escape it. Even Hades sought to trick Persephone, risking the wrath of his brothers and sisters above. You're not trying to trick me, are you? Remus smiles at you, something somber in his expression. Rest assured, Kieran, I am. And if you think otherwise, it may be the case that I have already misled you. He blithely takes a sip of his drink, his eyes never leaving yours. You finger the fragile stem of your teacup as you consider the golden surface of your drink. You can't help but feel self-conscious under his gaze. What if I drink the whole thing? And what happens if I drink the whole cup? That would depend. What is it you would wish to happen? You look down at the clear, amber liquid swirling around in your teacup. I asked you once what you would leave behind in your absence. You do not have an optimistic estimate of your worth above, Kieran. Your ears ring for a reason you can't place, like waking up with, t with tinnitus or from a concert you can't remember attending. One second, I got something in my eye. Uh, get out of my eye, you fucking fuck. Ah, okay. But down here, you could be worth so much more. This world needs you. Your friends need you. Drink the cup, Kieran, and you can join me. I'm gonna be here until everything else has been washed away. Until we're but imprints left on Peregrine's shores. He's right. Remus is offering you everything you'd ever wanted. With the resolution turned away and a happy ending within your grasp, why would you ever want to leave this place? Drink. Your hands are steady as you reach for the ceramic handle of the cup, but where you expect your fingers to close around the teacup, instead they pass through the object like it's immaterial. Huh? After a few tries, you realize it's not the cup that's ghostly. It's you. Your hand is losing color, fading in opacity. You can see the glass surface of the table through the back of your hand. What? What's going on? Remus leans over the table to grip your other hand, the one that's still solid, and looks you dead in the eye. I'm here with you, Kieran. Just look at me. It's gonna be alright. You're okay. Take a deep breath for me. He rises to his feet, pulling you up with him as you breathe. He loops around the table to pull you into a hug, the other hand nestled in the fur on the back of your head. Remus is solid, warm, and his heartbeat is steady. You almost forget what's happening, your cheek pressed into the fabric of his shirt and held in his embrace. When you look up at the table there, like a bad memory from your past, is an object that makes your heart plummet. It's the dick, standing erect between your beside your neglected teacup. A wave of deja vu washes over you. It's the dick. Remus pulls you in, his grip around the back of your head almost imperceptibly tighter. You can hear his chest rumble as he speaks. Yes. I told you once all lost objects would return once the void was defeated. But you didn't defeat it. You never did. Last time you checked, the dick was lost somewhere in the void, which means if you're seeing it right now, where... 
I'm in the void? Then that means this isn't real. You're not real. You push yourself away from Remus, his hand trailing against your side like he's reluctant to let you go. He doesn't say anything for a moment before finally admitting, No, I am not, and neither of this is this world. But isn't it enough? Remus gestures to the beautiful garden around you, to the gazebo and the tiered tray of biscuits on the table. The afternoon sun is warm, and a cool breeze ruffles your fur and leaves on the bushes around you. The void can only show you what you want, Kieran, because it wants you to stay. It will give you whatever it is you desire, anything you could wish for. For above all else, it cares only for you. Can you say the name, can you say the same for the world above? He pauses for emphasis, and though you know better, a part of you believes him. This world must end, yes, but only insofar as all things must come to a close, one way or another. You will not be exempt from this rule, even if you leave. There is no world free from illusion. He frowns, like this is a revelation he's since made peace with. Stay, Karen. Peregrine needs you. Remus extends a hand out towards you. He's offering you what you've always wanted. A place where you belong. A place of friends, purpose, and most of all, hope. Even if you know it's a false one. You hesitantly reach out your hand towards his. As you extend your arm, you catch the sunlight passing through it like glass. A ghostly silhouette that's disappearing as you speak. You realize you can't stay like this. You can't stay here no matter how much you want or don't want to. You have no other choice. There's nothing for you here, and you're beginning to doubt if there ever was. You have to leave. I'm sorry. Towards the dick. You pad towards where the dick rests on the table, your feet heavy and your heart even heavier. It beckons you forward like a beacon, like waking up from a dream so good it's impossible. You feel the urge to claw your way back, even as it only slips from your fingers the harder you try. Reach for the dick. Suck the dick. No. Your hand moves closer to the dildo, and you sense a bit of sensation returning to your fingers. The outline of your hand becomes a little stronger, and your fingertips tingle with pins and needles. Remus watches you, frozen. You catch a glimpse of his expression, equal parts disappointed, mournful, and... proud? Grab the dick! Your fingers come into view as they close around the shaft of the dick. The entire world, world stills like a train screeching to a stop. Oh. Hmm. So, is this the path where Remus gets, uh, you know, put, in, put into the center stage here? Where you once stood in a three-dimensional landscape, now it's just you and Remus, two actors against a painted background. Good luck, Kieran. Remus smiles. You're sitting at the top of a roller coaster, waiting for the plummet. The car creaks forward in, and then the whole world collapses in on itself. Your stomach lurches as you're sucked into the black hole of void, the dick violently dragging you upwards like a homing missile searching for its target. You're leaving, and then you're gone. In the darkness, you walk for what seems like an eternity. Your ankle burns as you hobble through the emptiness, your hand still clenched around the dick like it's a lifeline. For all you know, it is. What is this place? You look around for any identifying landmarks, but there's nothing other than void as far as the eye can see. Ow! Your foot recoils in pain from the sharp object you stepped on. Bending down to pick it up, you find a thin wooden rail about three inches long and two wide. Hello? Is anyone out there? Only the silence responds. You're alone. No, I'm not. You're there, aren't you? Clearly you know who I am and what I want. What happened back here? What happened back there? That was all you, wasn't it? So tell me what to do. You keep walking. The void stretches out in front of you. No horizon to speak of. Finally, after a long moment, you hear the sound of rushing water in the distance. At this point, you're grateful to hear anything other than the sound of your own voice. You race towards the sound as best you can with your one good leg. In the distance, you spot an enormous cascading waterfall, thunderous in the empty void. What is this place? This is the void. Great, thanks, I got that part, but why am I here? How do I get back? All things that are lost in Peregrine must pass through here. This is where they are recycled and repurposed into something new. You cannot return to Peregrine because this is Peregrine, don't you see? As you approach the waterfall, you realize that its flow never quite reaches the ground. Before it does, it dissipates into the air and seems to float into the void. Its particles warp before your very eyes. You recognize it as what was happening to you when your hand became transparent. You're being unraveled, mined, harvested so that you could give birth to a new world. Okay, okay, I get it. I'm just a threat or raw materials or whatever. 
Is that what happened to everyone else who came through here? Remus mentioned there were others before me. They got chopped up and processed down here, turned into more world? They were given everything they wanted, just like you. Had you stayed, you would have eventually become like them. Mountains and rivers, landmarks and lives. Except I left. Except you left. You could have stayed and been happy. Wasn't it what you'd wanted? Why wasn't it enough? Why did you leave? Hmm. Well, it wasn't real. I couldn't have stayed. Did that ever matter? You experience what you can only describe as the universe shrugging. You can do whatever you like. All things must come to an end, but you have to know your return will not be easy. I had to go home. What home? You experience what you don't... Okay. Alright, so... I was dying. Oh, I don't know. Maybe because I was literally disappearing by staying there? Does it matter? Can I even go back? Silence confirms what you already knew. The experience we can only describe is the universe shrugging. You can do whatever you like. All things must come to an end, but you have to know. Your return will not be easy. You think about Remus. The real Remus. Who got you in this situation in the first place. You have to face him again if you want to leave. <coughs> oh, goodness. Jesus. Okay. Mm. Your anchor tethers you to the layer above Peregrine, the world you came from. You feel the dick buzz in your hand. All right, y'all. I'm going to pause it right there. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, ring that notification bell, and check out our Patreon if you can. It always helps. Before I go, I'm going to give a quick shout-out to our lovely bronze tier patrons. Thank you all for all you do for the channel. We greatly appreciate your support. Thank you to our silver tier patron, Kate Silvermoon. Thank you for a bit above and beyond. It's greatly appreciated. And thank you to our gold tier patron, Tresum Guy. You're awesome. We love you. Thank you for subbing to Ultimate Tier. Anyway, if y'all want to get your names in the credits, get access to all of our Not Safe Work contents as little as $5. Alrighty, I love you all, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye-bye!